I'll be reading from verse 11. That day Moses charged the people, saying, When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's nakedness, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe, to shed innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. And we also say, Amen, when we finish the passage. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your unchanging truth, uh, that we can um, just rely on you, and listen to your voice, uh, regardless of what our circumstances are. And God, um, we're in such unprecedented times these days, uh, Lord, not only with the coronavirus, but just with the, the unrest in our nation, in our local communities. And, and Lord, uh, it does kind of feel like the world is falling apart. And God, it's just such a joy. And um, Lord, we praise you that even though things are falling apart, even though um, there are times when everything seems like they're going right, uh, God, you are constant and you are unchanging. You are faithful in your love and you are faithful in your truth. And God, uh, we can truly rely on you and trust you because you are worthy. So we thank you for your word today. We thank you that we can receive it with joy. We thank you that we can hear your voice. We thank you that we can know who you are and know your truth because of your son, Jesus and through the work of your Holy Spirit in us. So would you shape us? Would you refresh us? Would you just lead us, God, today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This might be a kind of a weird passage for, you, uh, for most people to read in the Bible. I mean, uh, we tend to associate God with blessings, and when we pray to God, oftentimes we're praying for blessing, and we're thanking Him for blessing, um, but the most used word in this passage is cursed. So it almost seems contrary that um, it's, we, we basically have here a list of curses. And isn't God all about blessing people? I mean, you might be asking that question. And I know that I definitely ask that question sometimes when I read passages of Scripture that seem to just be just lists of curses and, and condemnation and judgment and hell and brimstone and fire and but we need to keep in mind that there's always two signs, sides to the, to the coin, especially when we're talking about justice, is that there's blessing for the good, there's blessing for obedience, there's blessing for faithfulness, but there's a flip side to it. There has to be punishment for evil. There has to be cursing of sin and wickedness and injustice. And today's passage, these, these public communal affirmation of these, these heinous acts, these acts of wickedness um, that they're putting a curse on through the command of God, this, these acts, these collections of, of things that are described all have to do with things that are done in secret. Right? These are not just public sins. Even though 
everyone kind of agrees, with, you know, whether Christian or not, that all of these things are terrible things to do. The difficult thing is that in society, even in our justice systems, um, and the justice system of these ancient times in Israel, these were all things that were hard to prove and hard to prosecute because of the nature of the action. They were done in secret. There were no witnesses. Um, these are kind of assumed. But the thing is that God still cares about what we do in secret. He doesn't care about just the things that we do outwardly outside of our homes. He doesn't care just about how we treat our families and our close uh, people in our lives. He also cares about what we do in secret when no one else is watching. He also cares about the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. And I think we all understand this, but there's, there's more clarity that we can get from the scriptures about how God and his justice is truly perfect, even when it comes to the things that are hidden from mankind, even when it comes to things that never make it to court, never make it into our justice systems, never make it to be condemned by the people, when these things happen in secret, God is still aware. God is watching. God, is, uh, God sees all. He sees the good that we do in secret, but he also sees the evil that we do in secret. I think this topic for, is especially relevant to us today because most of the things that, um, that rile us up, that make us upset, just even society, even though society is skewed in its standards of morality because they're constantly changing, um, one thing that we happen to agree upon in terms of the church and the world is that uh, sexual oppression is wicked and evil, and so racism is also wicked and evil. But the problem with these two things is that most of the time, and we'll just talk, I'll just use racism as an example, racism is not an outwardly visible thing. Most of the time, racism is a secret, silent sin. It's a condition of someone's heart, just like any other prejudice, that is willing to condemn and judge and look down upon others internally, primarily. And every so often, and when the opportunities present themselves, that racism will actually take some sort of visible, tangible sort of effect, but the cause is a silent, unseen sin. The question for today is, what about secret sin? What does God think about secret sins? And the central idea of our passage today is that God condemns all sin. God condemns all sin, whether they're public sins, whether they're secret sins, whether they're sins that Never leave your mind or your heart. God knows and he sees and he judges. He condemns all sins, even the ones we don't see. And I think one of the things that um, has been happening, not just in the recent months, but in the recent years, is that a lot of these secret sins and these secret prejudices, these secret injustices, are starting to show their faces in our society. And clearly, many of us are having a response towards those injustices, those evils, uh, those prejudices that only breed conflict and hostility. But the sermon in a sentence for us is that as God condemns all sin, we as Christians, as the church, but really everyone, there's only one thing that we can do about it. We need to turn to Christ because he's the only solution to sin and its curse. Jesus is the only solution to sin and its curse. And therefore, we must all turn to Christ. We must all trust in Christ and continue to lean on him and live in his ways. See, Israel, they were the covenant people of God meaning that they entered into not only a spiritual contract, but a spiritual contract that was like what we consider a legal contract. And with any contract, with any covenant, there are terms that are need, 
that, that, that come with it. See, God blessed the Israelites. He delivered them from slavery. He gave them a land to call their own. He gave them the perfect law of his own heart to live by. But this covenant didn't just come with blessing. But like any covenant, like any system of justice, there are blessings and there are also curses. And you can see that Moses, he's charging the people. This is uh, the book of Deuteronomy takes place before the Israelites enter the promised land. They're right about to go into the promised land. And Moses is charging the people, once you enter the promised land, half of the tribes, six tribes will go on to one mountain, Mount Gerizim, and proclaim the blessings of God. But the other six tribes will proclaim the curses of God's covenant. And this, this isn't saying that the six tribes that were selected were good, and the six tribes that were selected for the curses were bad. It was just splitting it half and half on two mountains that weren't too far from each other. In fact, some uh, historians believe that when large groups of people gather on these mountains, that the acoustics would actually allow them to hear one another. But the point is that this was meant to be a communal demonstration of God's covenant, that God's covenant involved immense blessings. But at the same time, failure to abide by the terms of this covenant, failure to obey the commands of, of God, the law of morality and justice would result in these curses and the community was meant to affirm both the blessings and the curses of God together. But in order for us to understand the magnitude of these curses that are listed here, I think it's, I think it's um, needed to really talk about what a curse is. It's not something that we uh, really do or think about the same way as uh, the ancient um, Israelites and you know, just ancient people in general thought about curses. When we talk about cursing today, we're usually talking about using bad words, curse words, or cuss words, but the kind of curses that are talked about in our passage today are uh, very different than just the words, the hurtful words that can come out of our mouths. Curses are as significant as their origin. And that's why the curses of today's passage are, are way more significant than someone using a curse word to you know, just express their anger or their hatred towards another person because they're only as significant as their origin. And when you curse at someone because you're upset with them, because they hurt, they hurt your feelings or, you know, whatever, they disagree with you, whatever the situation might be, if that curse is just coming from you, that's just as potent as it is. It's just, just another human being getting upset. But the curses from God need to be taken as seriously as God himself, the same way the curses of man should be, just be taken as seriously as we take man. In ancient times, curses were used to describe not so much what human beings say to one another, but curses were almost exclusively derived from divine beings. So curses were the words of man being transmitted, but really finding their origin in some kind of God or divine being, not just human words. So these curses in our passage today, being from God, God Almighty, Yahweh, were to be taken as seriously as reality itself. Why? Because God is the absolute almighty king of the universe. So these curses are not empty threats, like some empty threats we might throw at people when we're angry and cursing at them, but these curses were real condemnation from the Almighty God, real condemnation from the true judge of the universe. And the thing about biblical curses is that curses don't end just with an individual. See, that's the difference between a curse and just a regular punishment. A curse was something that had consequences that passed on through generations. God didn't punish people for the sins of their fathers, but sometimes the curses of ancestral sins, we still see the effects of those happening through multiple generations. And lastly, another characteristic about curses is that because they are divine in nature, meaning because curses find their origin in God himself, they cannot be resolved by human means. The solution to a curse 
that is divine in nature must be divine in nature. These curses that are given in today's passage for these specific kinds of secret sins cannot be broken by human means. They must be resolved by divine means. They must, they, there's no natural solution to them. There must be a supernatural solution. I think one of the best examples of this is just the first curse we see in the Bible and actually the first curse in our creation was the curse that resulted from Adam and Eve's disobedience. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, God made it really clear. He said, here's the garden. You can eat of any fruit of any tree, but don't eat of this tree because if you eat of this tree, you will be cursed. And the curse that was specified specifically was if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. See, God promised death as a curse for disobedience. And that death did, wasn't just simple death as if, as if a life was coming to an end, but it was actually a chain reaction. It was actually a divine curse for disobedience. This started a chain reaction of sin and evil, death and darkness that literally has been passed down for every generation since then. In fact, we live with the same consequences or we live with the consequences of that disobedience because of the curse that was given. Started a chain reaction and death became a reality of creation. Before the sin of Adam and Eve, death wasn't a reality. Death only entered into this created reality of God because those that he had put in charge of creation turned away from him. And we still experience that today. I think one of the most shocking things that happened this year, just as much as the coronavirus, was the death of Kobe Bryant. You know, no one expected Kobe to die. And, you know, I'm a basketball fan, but I've never met Kobe. I don't have any kind of personal connection to him, but I think many of us throughout the world, for some reason, we just felt so connected. It felt so personal that Kobe... Bryant and his daughter Gianna, as well as others on the helicopter, were taken from us. They died just like that. No one expected it to happen. It wasn't a slow process like uh, some other deaths, but it was an unexpected death. And that is just such a recent and fresh example of how death is a part of our reality. It's just something we live with, and it's painful. It sucks. Another consequence was that sin became a part of human nature before the sin of Adam and Eve. Sin wasn't a part of our nature. We were good in every way. But because of the sin of Adam and Eve and the curse that resulted, all humankind, our nature, became tainted. We became sinful. You know, and there's always differing opinions, differing worldviews. Are humans inherently good? Are humans inherently evil? I think sometimes when you oversimplify the Christian point of view, the, you think that Christians believe that human beings are inherently evil, but not really. Humans are inherently good because when God created us, we were all good. But our nature became tainted in sin such that now our perverted nature is inherently evil. If you don't agree with me, just ask simple why, why do we have locks on our doors? Why do we lock our cars? Why do we lock our homes? If humans are inherently good, why do we do that? Also, what, what became a result of humankind's nature being tainted is that we began to hate each other. We began to become selfish. We began to get greedy. We began to become corrupted. And that's where we see so many injustices in not only our lives, but throughout history with racism, sexual abuse, all different kinds of wars and oppression. Also, we see disease, suffering, and destruction enter into creation because of the curse. Coronavirus, right? This pandemic is evidence that this curse is still real. This curse of sin that perverted our reality. Poverty that we see all over the place. Unable to break out of those cycles of poverty. Unemployment as a result of coronavirus as well as other things. 
looting and crime. These are all evidences of suffering, disease, destruction that are part of sin's curse. And lastly, blindness and rejection of the truth. See, that so many in the world, even so many that call themselves Christian, call themselves the church, reject the truth of God's word. We, we are, and not only, the, not only in the church, but out of the church, denying the word of God, denying Christ. But also, we see so much complicitness with evil, which is also a way of turning a blind eye to evil turning a blind eye from what is true and accepting what is false. I think a perfect example of this is um, like with, with uh, people who smoke cigarettes. All of them know that it's bad for them, right? Everyone who knows smokes cigarettes knows that it's terrible, it increases your risk of cancer, you know, all these bad things, but they still do it anyways. And I'm not saying that, you know, they're the only evil ones. We all do this. We all know things are bad for us, but we still do it. Why? Because of the curse of sin, we have a, we have a tendency to turn a blind eye and reject the truth of life. What we're seeing in our nation today is just a glimpse of how per potent the curse of sin is. If you've been watching the news or if you've been on YouTube or Facebook or anything, you can't avoid it. And I think... We're starting to feel like, man, our nation is falling apart. Our world is falling apart. Our communities are falling apart. And actually, I think that in, 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 in a very real sense, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we see how potent the curse of sin is. Because, you know, when things are all going the way they're supposed to be going, when the stock market's doing well, when there's no riots and protests, when there's no police injustices that are flooding our flooding our news channels, when these things are just kind of not really exposed to us. Even though they're happening out there, injustice is always happening out there. When we don't see it, we can just feel like, oh, everything's the same. Everything's fine. Reality's not cursed. There's no urgency for justice. There's no urgency for repentance. There's no urgency for morality and truth. And we become distracted with other things. The recent events of George Floyd's murder in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and the response of the public, these are all really a, a prime example of how broken our reality truly is. I'm not saying this to condemn any specific group. But I am saying this to show how condemned we are as a species, as a human race. We see the effects of sin's original curse from Adam and Eve's disobedience all throughout us. The ones I just listed. Death, sin, disease, blindness, and rejection of the truth. We see death. George Floyd died. He was murdered, like many before him. The sin was that he was murdered. He didn't deserve to be killed for trying to use a fake $20 bill. We see disease, suffering, and destruction because all of this happened in the context of this coronavirus pandemic where people are losing their jobs, people are suffering from actually being sick, losing loved ones, mourning, people are <laughs> losing their businesses and their property, the stock market's plummeting, depression and suicide are spiking, and we also see suffering and destruction in the acts um, that followed, in the violence of looters and rioters, who maybe felt like they didn't have anything to begin with, and now more things were being taken from them. We see blindness and rejection of the truth, rejecting the truth that black lives do matter. Black lives matter. But we can see that in the example even of uh, the officer, Derek Chauvin, that they rejected this truth. They were blind to it, maybe willingly, that all human beings are made in the image of God, that life is precious, that we should treat each other with dignity and respect, we reject this truth constantly, not only by racism, but through the taking of life, whether it's taking of life outside of, of, of the womb or inside of the womb. We see rejection of the officers who stood complicitly by when Derek Chauvin was performing a lethal technique 
on George Floyd. We see those officers are being charged now. Why? Because they turned a blind eye to injustice. They were complicit in the murder of George Floyd. All of this is to point towards the fact that it's not just the police. It's not just white people. It's not just the rioters. It's not just the looters. It's not the protesters. It's not the church. This is a human condition. It's so easy to point the finger at the injustices that are visible and condemn them and curse them even without understanding that really this is a common problem. This is the curse of sin. Martin Luther King is famous for his quote, rioting is the language of the unheard. And so many people, especially black Americans, feel unheard and unseen. They feel unheard and unseen by the justice system, feel unheard and unseen by the, you know, large groups, uh, specifically um, white Americans. They're trying to earn what's rightfully theirs ever since, you know, reparations at the end of the Civil War. The justice system continues to fail them as well as many others. Just to put into perspective, 13% of the U.S. population are black, whereas they make up 38% of the prison population. But God sees all injustice. See, writing may be the language of the unheard, but God is the God of all people. He is the judge of what is heard and unheard. He is the judge and righteous, perfect king over all things, whether they are seen or unseen by man. And one thing that we shouldn't miss from the scriptures is that God will leave no sin unpunished. God will leave no sin unpunished. God sees all that is unseen by man. And that's what we see in this list of curses for these sins. For those who dishonor father or mother, this happens in a household. This might not be a public thing. God sees that. And we should take this seriously too. This isn't, you know, this is part of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. We are called to honor our father and mother. Cursed is anyone who moves his neighbor's landmarks. This was a boundary line. This was to secretly move someone's uh, landmark to try to expand your territory without their knowing. This is deceitfulness and taking the property of someone, uh, someone else's. This merits a curse from God. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. I'm not sure what this would be for other than to rob the blind man, to take whatever value they might have or even do something worse. Taking advantage of someone who has a disability, unable to see, and taking advantage for your own good. Cursed be anyone who perverts justice. Anyone, not just the judges, not just the government, anyone who perverts justice to the sojourner, the immigrant, the fatherless, the disadvantaged, the widow, those that are unheard, those that are un underrepresented or misrepresented. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife. This goes without saying. There's all kinds of incest in here. Cursed be anyone who sleeps with an animal. I think we can all agree that those are bad things. But cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law, and cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret. 25, cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And that might sound like an assassin, but this is likely talking about some kind of elected official or some kind of leader or judiciary who takes a bribe to pervert justice. You know, these descriptions of secret sins are all difficult to prove and prosecute. However, the reason why the community is cursing this together in this passage is because it's to affirm the fact that they can rest assured that even as these heinous acts happen in secret, even though these sins are happening under the cover of darkness and deceit, that nothing gets past the justice of God. God is perfect as a judge. He is righteous in cursing all those that commit sin, not only in publicly, but especially those in secret. Because the idea is many people would get away with these sins. Why? Because it was never brought to the communal justice system, whatever it was. But they can rest assured that even if none of these get brought to court, 
or there is no societal justice system that makes them pay for their sins, that God is still righteous as a judge, and he is cursing those that commit sins. Now, this can seem like good news, and it is good news, that we have a God who hears the unheard, who sees what is unseen, and still carries out his perfect justice. But the perfect, all-seeing God who is just in all ways. So this is both good news to us and bad news to us. I'd like to look at verse 26. It says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. The law of God is the true standard of morality. Human standards are constantly fluctuating. You look throughout history, throughout generations, and you see that human beings, we change our mind all the time on what is right and what is wrong. There may be overlapping points throughout history, and there may be overlapping areas where both the church and the world agree that something is wrong, such as racism. But the church must always hold to the unchanging standard of God's law rather than being carried by the pressures of the world for what they define as justice. Here's the bad news for us. The bad news is not those that are engaging in bestiality and incest and you know all these like murder and things like that. These aren't the only ones that are cursed, but verse 26 says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. This law refers to more than just what is contained in our passage, but it's referring to the whole book of Deuteronomy. In fact, you can even argue that it's, com- it's, it's, it's referring to the whole five books, the Torah that was written by Moses. This was often referred to as the law. Now, we know that no one could confirm the words of all of God's perfect law perfectly. So the bad news for us is that we are all cursed under the law of God. The good news is that God curses those who might seem like they're getting away with sin. God will curse them in His justice. But the bad news is that we are all cursed under the law of God. John 3.16 is probably the most famous verse in the Bible. It says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. But I'll read on. Verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. And this is the thing that many times non-Christians will react in aggression towards Christians because when we share the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came to save, because we are all headed to hell without Him. They feel the condemnation. And they think of the gospel as a, as a message of condemnation rather than salvation. But here's where they get it wrong. It's in verse 18 of John chapter 3. I'm just reading on from John 3.16. In verse 18 it says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. You see, the false assumption that we make, and this is common to all men, is that we are not condemned. The assumption that we make is that the curse of Adam and Eve, that didn't have an effect on me. At least not in in the way that I am cursed, but that I am actually saved. We are good in some way. You see, when Christians, when, when Jesus came and he, and he shared the gospel of truth, when Christians share the gospel of Jesus, we aren't bringing condemnation to anyone because everyone is already condemned. We are bringing the salvation of God. And we see that even in the Old Testament. Even as God is sharing His law, we see in verse 26 very clearly, cursed is anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. 
and there was nobody that confirmed the whole law, doing the whole law except Christ. See, just as we are under the curse of Adam and Eve's sin, so were the Israelites. Nobody was perfect then, and no one is perfect now except Christ. See, God is so righteous as a judge that he will never leave sin unpunished. That's the thing that actually upsets us the most, is when we see evil, when we see sin, when we see injustice go unpunished, that is what upsets us the most. You know, I was listening to the San Francisco police chief um, address uh, the city on the news after the first riots and looting happened um, after the protests. And he's an African-American uh, police chief. And he said he joined the police force in LAPD in the year 1990. And he was there in the 1992 LA riots where 64 people died in one night. He remembered that and he was calling the city to protest peacefully, to stay at home, to not needlessly be violent or riot or loot. And if you were alive during that time, or if you were an adult, or I was alive, but I wasn't aware of the Rodney King riots, but if you look into it, why did that happen? Why did the riots happen then, and why are the riots happening now? It's because the judge, the judicial system, justice, whatever you want to call it, because we're seeing evil go unpunished. In the Rodney King situation, there's video of four officers brutally beating Rodney King for 15 minutes. But when it was brought to trial, a jury acquitted all four officers from the charge of excessive use of force. Anyone that could tell you that was excessive use of force at the very least. It was that injustice that as, as well as other things that were happening in that context that led to the L.A. riots. You see, what we actually want, perfect justice, is only found in God. God is the perfect judge. And He will leave no sin unpunished. But the bad news is that, you know, oftentimes it's easy to focus on the sins of someone else. And I want us to be careful as Christians. And if you're listening and you're not a Christian, but you're against racism, I, 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 this is also for you. We need to be careful in a time like this not to think that by condemning racism that we somehow save ourselves from our own sin. You see, we're all condemned because of the curse of sin, and God will leave no sin unpunished. He will not leave my sin unpunished. He will not leave your sin unpunished or anyone else's. That's how perfect God is in His justice. But this is why Christ came to save and not condemn, because Christ paid for our sin. See, that's what it means to be saved. It's, it's not saying that God didn't punish you for your sin or that God won't punish you for your sin. It's that God already punished Christ for your sin. That's how salvation works. See, God is so just. You could sit there and say, oh, why doesn't God just forgive everyone? Why doesn't God just stop all the evil? Why? Because God is righteous. He's the perfect judge. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he have to die in order to save us? Because God is righteous. And forgiveness means nothing without payment. God will leave no sin unpunished. All sinners will be cursed, condemned, and have to pay the price for their sins unless their debt has already been paid in Christ. So in the song we sang earlier, Man of Sorrows, it says, Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free. Oh, He's free indeed. You see, we have freedom in Christ because we are no longer subject to the divine curse of sin. There's no human solution to curses that are divine. And what we see all around us, what we see in the news, not only now, but every day, the news is so filled with all the negative things going on in the world. That's evidence of the curse that we are under in this reality. 
But in Christ, we have freedom. In Christ, we can break that curse. Why? Because he had paid the price for us. And he didn't just pay the price. It wasn't just any blood that was shed, but Christ was the only one that did not deserve to be cursed. He's the only one that confirmed the words of this law by doing them in their completion. Yet he gave himself up for us. God will leave no sin unpunished. But what makes our God amazing and gracious and wonderful, so beyond our understanding, is God will leave no sin unpunished, but he would also love us enough to punish the sinless to save us. This is the gospel. See, we are all condemned. Our world is condemned. And there's only one Savior, Jesus. And I'm not saying this to say that the protests are meaningless. I'm not saying this to say that the things that we do, how we use uh, our voices, our vote, how we organize and move towards a better society are useless. They are not. We are called to continue the same way. The, the, you know, the law of God is, is called to be lived out in this world. In this broken world, we are called to live out the righteousness that we see in Christ. Those are meaningful. Those are significant things. Those are significant efforts. So much has been accomplished through peaceful protest. But the only real ultimate solution to the curse that we see around us. You see, we don't just see one problem with the world right now showing its face. We see a myriad of issues. And those all point to the curse of sin. There's only one solution to this. It's in Christ. There is no salvation outside of putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. If you could show the next slide. Galatians 2.16. It, it shows us that even as God was giving this law in the Old Testament that we see being referenced in Deuteronomy, ultimately that wasn't the way people would be saved. See, God's plan was for people to be saved in His Son, Christ. In Galatians 2.16, it says, Yet we know that we have a person who is not, that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. No one will be justified by works of the law. That was part of the reason God gave the law, was to show this is what perfect righteousness looks like. This is what actual morality looks like. This is what perfect justice looks like. And you will fall short. We will all fall short. And that's why nobody can be freed from the curse of sin, a divine curse from God, His response of justice towards evil. No one can be freed from that without supernatural means, without the Christ, the Savior, the sacrifice who paid our penalty for us. God condemns all sin, even the ones we don't see. We all have secret sins. We all have to repent of those sins. We all need to turn away from whatever it is we hope will save us. Now, I am, I believe it is the role of the church to condemn injustice and promote the justice and righteousness of Christ. But I think something that we can get caught up in is to think that by doing so, by being voices of justice in this world, that somehow that earns us our righteousness not only in this world, but internally. Even as we do those things, we should understand that the only solution to the curse is Christ. Yes, we should be active in living out what is good and carrying out justice in all our capacities. But that's not what saves us. And that's not what's going to save them. When we look at Derek Chauvin as Christians, we should be praying for his repentance. When we look at the officers that are being charged, I don't know what's going to happen to them either. 
You should be praying that they will repent. Why? Because the curse is common. It's the same curse that we lived under. When, when we say that all have fallen sin, have fallen short of the glory of God, all have sinned, that includes us as Christians. It's easy to point the finger and condemn injustice, but know that God sees the wickedness of your heart. He sees the things that no one else sees, and yes, He will hold you accountable. That's why we must turn to Christ. He is the Savior of this curse. He's the only solution to sin and its, its consequences. In Romans 3.28, it tells us, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we condemn injustice, let's remember that God's gift of eternal life is in Christ Jesus for what He has paid for. We must hold to this truth as Christians. Because in many ways, there's, there's nothing more that certain people want than to see Derek Chauvin be punished for his crimes. There's nothing that people want more than seeing those racists, the, the white supremacists of our world today being punished for their crimes, maybe even killed for their crimes. And in some sense, you could argue, yeah, that would be righteous. That would be just. But when you look at the righteousness of Christ, He not only fulfilled the law, but He showed compassion on His persecutors, showed compassion on His oppressors. Even as He hung on the cross, He prays for forgiveness for those that just nailed His hands up there. See, that is what we fall short of. That's true goodness and justice in Christ. God condemns all sins, even the ones we don't see. But our only hope is to put our hope in Christ. And as Christians, we ought to live like Christ. We ought to live in repentance, turning to Christ and following in His footsteps, not the footsteps of the world. Even as we, we come alongside the world, our nation, those that are hurting in this issue, we must do so in a manner that displays the glory of Christ. We must do so in a manner that makes Christ the solution, not the lost. It needs to make Christ the solution, not education. You see, racists know that they're wrong. The world tries to preach that education and ignorance, the lack of education and ignorance are, are the cause for racism. Is that if we educate people enough that racism will stop, that's not true. There's plenty of educated people that are still racist. The problem is the heart. The problem is the curse that grips all of us unless we are set free by Christ Himself. That's why we need to repent and turn to Christ. This starts with the church. The church, we must repent. We need to repent of our own prejudices. We need to repent of our own traditions and ways of racism that may have entered into, our, into what is just normal for us. And I'm not calling out white churches. I'm calling out all churches. I'm calling out all different kinds of churches. Korean churches, Chinese churches, whatever other churches. No one is free from prejudice. And we see how evil the curse of sin is. But the solution is in Christ, and it must be first displayed in the church. So we need to repent. Turn to Christ. He's the only solution. If you're tuning in today as a non-believer, you need to turn to Christ too. Because God is going to hold you accountable to all your sins. Your sins might not be the ones that the world condemns, but God's standard for morality is higher than the world's. And we will all fall short and be guilty. There's one solution. It's in Christ. So put your trust and hope in Christ because He has already paid for you on the cross. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. What an awesome truth it is that our God is perfect in His justice. That there's no evil that He overlooks or just dismisses, but He brings every evil to justice. But what a terrifying, fearful truth that is, because we 
are all guilty. The good news, the solution, is that this curse can be broken by the solution that was already offered to us in Christ. So even as we fight the battles in civil society, as I preached on last week, even as we fight the battle, even as we take a prominent place in being a voice for justice on these kind of issues, we must remember that the world is falling apart because of the curse of sin. That's the ultimate cause. And the ultimate solution is in Christ alone. Let's all turn to Him. Let's all point to Him. And let's all repent, turn away from everything else that might be presenting itself as a false solution. Let's trust in the Lord, the perfect Son of God, who came not to condemn, but to save us from the condemnation that we already have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, God, you are a solution. Lord, we are the problem. We caused this curse that plagues us, Lord, on every level of our existence. So like every time something seems to be going good, Lord, we're reminded of how broken we are, how broken our society is, how broken our world is. And Lord, sometimes we live under this illusion that everything's okay. But Lord, everything is not okay. The world is falling apart whether or not we want to acknowledge it or not, and there's only one cure, and it's you. Because, God, we have hope that you will come and exact your perfect justice on the earth and wipe all evil away. But, God, you have also provided a way for us to be saved when that happens, because we will surely be found guilty unless our price has been paid for in Christ. So, Lord, help us to turn to you. Help us to repent. Lord, would you refine your church, your people, we are called to display your glory. There is no room for hatred and prejudice within our ranks, as well as any kind of other secret underlying dark sin. Lord, would you unearth those things? Would you expose those things and lead us to mourn and repent? And Lord, would you lead the world to turn from their ways and be healed and find their hope in Christ, the only solution to this curse of evil? Lord, we thank you for sending him. We thank you for the perfection and the justification that we are granted in him. We thank you for this free gift that we cannot earn with our works, but Lord, that you earned with your perfect life. God, help us to trust in you. Help us to make you the solution in all our actions, in our words, our thoughts, because that's what's true. Help us not to be blind or reject the truth of your word. Help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us to see our land be healed. Lord, we pray that you would minister to the pain, minister to the suffering, the death, the hostility that we are seeing all around us. Lord, would you help us? We need you. We have no solution in of ourselves. God, you are the only cure. We confess that today. Lord, would you be made strong in our weakness? Would you humble us more, whatever it takes, so that we can see you and turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.